Good evening. It's my distinct privilege to welcome all of you to the second LCJN Memorial Lecture. However, I do it alone. Normally, Swati and I would be here together. Unfortunately, she is in an emergency room in a hospital, so uh, you'll have to apologize her and excuse her for her absence. Uh, it is a great pleasure for us that uh, we have brought the L.C. Jain lecture from Delhi, where we inaugurated it two years ago, to Bangalore, which is not only our Karmabhumi of Janagrahas, but also the place where we met with Mr. Jain and Devaki and their wonderful family. So we are delighted that we could bring the second L.C. Jain Memorial Lecture to Bangalore. Let me start with thanking a few people before I introduce our speaker for the day. I'd like to begin by thanking Devaki, Vasu, and Gopal for the extraordinary grace with which they have engaged with this subject soon after Sri Jain passed away. We felt that it would only be fitting to have something done in his memory, but something that would live on, where each time we would talk about an issue that he would have cared about and he would have liked to have seen spoken of. And when we broached the subject to Devaki and her sons, they not only readily agreed, but enthusiastically engaged with this. We had the inaugural LCJN lecture done in Delhi, where we had Archbishop Desmond Tutu come and talk about uh, Nelson Mandela and the links that the Jains had with the South African independence movement. We'd also like to thank our board members who, as we marked Mr. Jain's passage, immediately said that we should do something in his memory, and in fact suggested this particular subject that we should have a memorial lecture uh, in his name. So we're grateful to our board members, many of whom are here with us today. I won't name you. But thank you for suggesting it, and thank you for encouraging us to do this. In this light, I would like to particularly call out one of our board members, Mr. V. Ramachandran, who unfortunately passed away on the 1st of December. Like Mr. Jain, he was also a remarkable personality, somebody who had started his career as the district collector of Koilon, ended it professionally as the chief secretary of Kerala, but went on, like all committed patriots, to do many things for India in building institutions in the public as well as in the non-profit non spaces. He and Mr. and Sri Jain actually share something which is very special to us, which is despite all of the work that they did and despite all of the commitments that they had, as their life passed on and they began to reduce those obligations, both of them ended with only one institutional obligation, which was to be on the board of Janagraha. So we are deeply touched and honored that we had stalwarts like them and continue to have remarkable people on our board who share with us the wisdom of their experiences as we look to carry the baton forward. Let me also thank our own colleagues, the management committee, and especially Partha and his colleagues for pulling this off, for making sure that this happens in a manner that respects the spirit of Mr. Jain. And finally, let me talk about Mr. Jain, and then get to our speaker for the evening. I had actually, both Swati and I had a long scripted uh, presentation and a, and a talk that we were going to do, but you'll have to excuse me. I, don't, I didn't carry that. I'm coming straight from the hospital. Mr. Jain and Swati and I, we met each other over 15 years ago when we returned to India to try and do something in the social space. And it was simply extraordinary to see how much he gave of himself with his wisdom and his experiences to help us navigate our way through this very complex territory of public change. Over the years, we got to understand where he came from, and it was a deep wisdom filled with passion, and yet at the same time, giving us the space to do what we cared about. And that combination is very unique. So we, Swati and I often used to refer to him as Yoda, like in the Star Wars movie, both in stature as well as in wisdom. 
he had this extraordinary sense of a knowledge about the truth and yet at the same time this intense ability to listen to you when you were speaking uh, as though you were the most important person in the world at that time and then from your own words from your own experiences he would help you find the way forward and that's a unique gift and very much as yoda would say to all the millions millions of star wars followers may the force be with you mr jain would say the same thing to all of us who want to carry the baton forward let me end by introducing our speaker for the evening professor ashutosh varshni ashu as his friends fondly would call him and i'm going to read from this is this all goldman professor of political science and international and public policy public affairs at brown university he joined brown in 2009 before which he taught at harvard at the university of michigan ann arbor he was the 2008 winner of the guggenheim fellowship and the carnegie scholar awards his ethnic conflict and civic life hindus and muslims in india written and published in 2002 by yale won the gregory lobert prize for the of american political science association democracy development and the countryside urban rural struggles in india was published in 1995 in its phd dissertation form won the daniel lerner prize at mit his research and teachings cover three areas political economy of development indian politics and ethnicity and nationalism his academic papers have appeared in world politics perspectives on politics comparative politics daedalus world development journal of development studies journal of asian studies journal of democracy and so on in addition to professional journals and this is what distinguishes him is that he transitions from the peer reviewed academic publications to the world of more popularly read publications as well as many of you may know he is a contributing editor to indian express and writes regularly in other journals and periodicals as well he is currently working on india's rising cities the north south economic divergence in india and a multi country project on cities and ethnic conflict in addition to his role in the political science department at brown professor varshni also is the founder director of the brown india institute which is located at the watson center for international affairs and he it's a multidisciplinary approach to understanding contemporary issues in india we have our own partnership with professor varshni and his colleagues at brown and it's been a privilege over the last few years to have worked together and again he brings a unique sharpness of thinking with an open mindedness that one would expect from the best academicians so it is with great pride and honor that i welcome professor varshni to deliver the second lcjn memorial lecture in bangalore Thank you very much, uh, Ramesh, for that very, very kind introduction. <clears throat> This one is also on, right? So I can move over. <clears throat> It's an honor to deliver the second Janagraha L.C. Jain Memorial Lecture. <clears throat> I did not have the privilege of uh, getting to know Mr. Jain very well. but i did meet him a few times what is interesting is that we share a friend we shared a friend my deceased mentor myron weiner ford international professor of political science at mit until his death was very close to lc jain they became friends as early as 1953 when devaki was not on the horizon um Myron and Sheila Myron's wife first arrived in India in 1953 for what became a lifelong intellectual voyage of discovery curiosity and research <clears throat> mentors become friends in american higher education so myron weena became my friend and i heard many stories about lc jain from myron vicariously therefore i know him well and um i know through such stories that lc jain was um had remarkable political commitments 
had remarkable political integrity, um, had a gentle demeanor, and was a man of great personal kindness and warmth. That's what I know. <clears throat> Finally, his book, Grass Without Roots, published in 1986, influenced many of us uh, in the 1980s, including me. The book underlined the significance of people's participation in rural development more clearly than most other books on the subject at that time. Um, so uh, some of what he wrote actually is reflected in my first book. I was working on uh, urban rural uh, 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 contestation at that time with a focus on the countryside. Today my work is on cities, so it's the other way around. So a great deal of agricultural and rural work was done at that time, and, and he played, his book played a role in the way th ideas developed. Anyway, my topic today is India's democracy, resilience, and inadequacies. I wish to argue that India's democracy is Janus-faced. Um, its electoral vibrancy is beyond doubt, but that electoral vibrancy coexists with substantial liberal deficits. A paradox that I'll explain um, at some length. <clears throat> Let us begin with the electoral vibrancy and summarize the data that stands out in international political science as quite distinctive for reasons that I'll outline. Since 1952, there have been 16 national elections and 352 state elections. Since 1992, three million local legislators are elected every five years, one third are women. In 1952, 81 million votes were cast. In 2014, fi nearly 555 million votes were cast. Until 1989, following mainstream democratic theory, the richer and more educated citizens voted much more than the poorer and the less educated since 1989, defying democratic theory. The poor and the less educated have voted as much as and perhaps more than their more fortunate co-citizens. Democratic theory argues that those who are richer, those who are more educated, those who are urban, those who have higher social status tend to vote more. That's a universal trend. Since 1989, India has defied it. <clears throat> but this remarkable electoral record coexists with a weaker record on the standard liberal freedoms, three in particular, I'll talk about a fourth later, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of association. It's not simply the case that these freedoms have been, have been at issue in more recent times. It's actually been a structural problem in India's democracy. These freedoms are extremely important for a democracy between elections. But these freedom, the rec India's record on these freedoms is not as strong as India's election record. And it's not that these freedoms do not exist, but they are not robustly anchored in Indian political consciousness and political record. <clears throat> so uh, one may have to say, um, as I'll uh, get into in detail later, one may have to say that the quality of Indian democracy is not very high. But whatever one can say about that, whatever one, means, one may say about the quality of Indian democracy, there is a prior question about democratic longevity which we must engage. Contemporary democratic theory, in addition to what I just briefly outlined, also says that democracies can be established at any level of income, but they survive only at high levels of income. A distinction, therefore, is drawn between establishment of democracies and resilience of democracies. In the West, universal franchise 
was introduced only after societies became rich. India is the longest surviving low-income universal franchise democracy in history. There is no other parallel. Why has democracy in India, still a lower middle income country, per capita income of about $1,600? And if you, at today's price, the 1947 per capita income was not more than $300, three to maybe $400. So in this range, $400 to $1,600, in this range, democracies, universal franchise democracies have not survived. Why did India not become a Pakistan or an Indonesia, which is more typical? In Pakistan and in Indonesia, democracy collapsed for long years and is still to stabilize. It's possible that it will stabilize, or it's likely to stabilize, let's say, in Indonesia. Another election, if it's free and fair, would begin to generate the same speculations about Indonesia as India did about three, about three decades ago or so. So, um, there are, there's one curiosity which is about income, and that uh, can be easily summed up. No wealth, no democracy, and India violates that. But India violates a second um, dictum as well. There's a second source of uh, skepticism about Indian democracy, which, which, which India has overcome, and that has to do with na nationhood. That second dictum is no nation, no democracy, nationhood is essential for democracy, and with its rampant diversities, India could not be a nation, was the standard argument. So, income is one, one uh, income-based argument is one argument that Indian democracy has, has violated, and nation-based argument is a second argument that Indian democracy has violated, and let's therefore begin to discuss this in some detail. Let's start with the economic or the, the income-based argument. Adam Shavorsky, Adam Shavorsky and his colleagues at New York University have come up with the most systematic data set on democracies and dictatorships. The data set covers 141 countries. And income, it turns out, is the best predictor of democracy. It correctly predicted the type of regime in 77.5% of the cases. Only in 22.5%, it did not. No other predictor, it should be noted, sometimes religion is brought in. No other predictor, religion, colonial legacy, ethnic diversity, international political environment, is as good uh, as income on the whole. India is in the latter 22.5% set. Indeed, if we consider only decolonized countries, the claim for India can be made more specific. Democracies that emerged from decolonization survived only in India, Mauritius, Belize, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. The odds the odds against democracy in India were extremely high. India is the most surprising case, according to uh, this data set, the most conclusive data set we have in the social sciences about the relationship between all kinds of variables and survival of democracy, income, religion, international political environment, colonial legacy. One should also note there is another exception on the other side. Some countries that were rich enough to be democratic but are not rich, and the biggest surprise on the high income side is Singapore. Singapore's per capita income has crossed $50,000. It is richer today than, than, than Britain, France, Germany in per capita terms. It is the only non-oil-based rich country that is not democratic the only non-oil-based uh, non rich country that is not democratic. So the biggest surprise on the low-income side, India, the biggest surprise on the high-income side, Singapore. The question is why? So this part is about um, my, my explanation, the explanation that I have developed in my latest book, as well as an article that appeared uh, two days ago. Um, the, 
uh, explanation for resilience can be divided into two parts. Some structural issues, the structure of, especially the identity structure in India, which I'll explain in a moment, and some strictly political issues. The structural constraints of a society do not, pure, do not entirely determine political trends. Politics is also about overcoming structural constraints. And the most important issue here, if we think about how politics, political constructions made a difference to Indian democracy, has to be the freedom movement and how a nation was built. And I'll start with, I'll start first with structural issues and then go on to the construction of Indian nationhood during the freedom struggle. Um, structurally speaking, the, the, the cleavage pattern in India is described by, the, uh, by a leading scholar of ethnic uh, conflict and identities, um, Donald Horowitz, teaches at Duke, as dispersed, not centrally focused. It's a category in the ethnic conflict literature. Dispersed um, cleavage structures and centrally focused uh, cleavage structures. What do we mean? Virtually all social identities of India are locally or regionally based. There are castes everywhere, but no single caste has a nationwide resonance. South Indian Brahmins and North Indian Brahmins cannot come together because North Indian Brahmins don't know who South, in South Indian Brahmins are, and vice versa. Dalits of uh, South India are very different from Dalits of North India. The category exists, but there is no All India Dalit party that can unite. And enough attempts have been made that can unite all Dalits of India. Language, too, is regionally based. There are more than 20 official languages, as you know. Tribes concentrated in central and, and, and northeastern India, but each tribe is different from the other. Only the Hindu-Muslim cleavage of India, when activated, threatens to acquire a near national dimension, but its main force is felt in the north and the west. As a result, and here is the point, here is the implication of a dispersed versus central focus distinction. The various forms of ethnic conflict, when they break out in India, get bottled up in one region or one part of the country. They do not pose an existential threat to the entire nation. India has not, ha has not had to choose between democracy and nationhood. The point is important because historically, whenever there has been a conflict between national existence and democracy, it's typically national existence or nationhood that wins out and democracy is suspended. Repeatedly a pattern in history. People would choose nationhood over democracy, but India has not had existential threats to nationhood. Furthermore, India's identities are, another distinction in, in ethnic conflict literature, are cross-cutting, not cumulative. What do we mean? India's Muslims, speak the language of the region in which they live, language therefore cross-cuts religion. The same applies to most of India's tribes, castes, and linguistic groups. Such identity structure is very different from a cumulative Sri Lanka, where the Tamils are religiously, linguistically, and on some accounts, though not all, racially distinct from the Sinhalese. So there is no cross-cutting pressure, it accumulates. As a result, the Sinhala Tamil conflict turned into one of Asia's nastiest civil wars, battering, the, the, battering Sri Lankan democracy for three decades. India has witnessed insurgencies, but, but without significant geographical spread. At no point since independence, have the insurgencies of India affected more than 3.5% of the nation's population? How I have calculated this, I'll be happy to, to, to discuss in Q&A. But the, the worst point actually was 89 through 91. Punjab insurgency had not died out and Kashmir had erupted. And Northeastern insurgencies, insurgencies had not fully died out. Even at that point, direct effect, directly affected India was only 3.5% of a total India. 
indirect effect has to be calculated differently, but there was nothing like the cumulative pressure in Sri Lanka between, in, uh, that the Tamil Sinhala conflict created, um, which was seen by many Sinhalese as an existential threat to Sri Lanka. You can also think of East Pakistan versus, versus West Pakistan in the late 60s, an existential threat. Uh, East, East Pakistani Bengali nationalism begin, began to pose for Pakistan's nationhood. Now let's get to the politics. This, these are the structural issues. In other words, multiple identities of India, rampant diversities of India, are what, that's one of the reasons why the nationhood has not been threatened. Had there been fewer identities, the threats would have been greater. It's the paradoxical conclusion of the field of ethnic conflict about India, a field in which I have worked for several years. Now, the argument about nationhood and democracy. There are two kinds of historical discourses that are relevant, and two, two kinds of claims that are relevant. One, um, that, that India's radical diversities made nationhood impossible, virtually impossible. And since India could not be a nation, it followed as a syllogism that it could not be a democracy either. So the question is, why is nationhood a necessary requirement for democracy? John Stuart Mill gave the best explanation in 1863. Free institutions are next to impossible in a country made up of different nationalities. Among a people without a fellow feeling, especially if they read and speak different languages, underlined. The united public opinion necessary to the working of representative government cannot exist. If we use modern language, modern uh, contemporary social science language, Mill's proposition can be reduced to or translated to the following. Regular democratic elections are about who should run a government of the nation. Democratic elections are not about whether one should, be, one should accept the nation at all. The latter, who is part of the nation, who is not, can be decided by referendum referendums which happen once in a long time. Hmm? But elections which happen every five years are analytically and politically distinct. If regular elections turn into battles over sovereignty, who is part of the nation who is not, then the elections are likely to be bloody, might unleash unmanageable passions and render voting judgments virtually impossible. For elections, periodic elections, to have meaning, the basic political unit should not be deeply in question. That is why national feeling is a prerequisite for democracy to function. Elections have no meaning if battles over sovereignty become um, a, a, a theme in election, is the point. That's the John Stuart Mill point. Now, <clears throat> This is not a point simply that John Stuart Mill made, and this is, in, in the implication for India is very clear. Then he goes on to talk about why India could not be a nation. But he was not the only one. At the higher levels of British administration in, in India, the argument was similar and perhaps influenced by John Stuart Mill, one of the great intellectuals in the second half of the 19th century. Here is John Strachey. There is not and never was in India or even any country of India possessing, according to any European ideas, any sort of unity, physical, political, social, or religious, and that men of Punjab, Bengal, the northeastern provinces, and Madras should ever feel that they belong to one in Indian nation is impossible. You might, with as much reason and probability, look forward to a time when a single nation will have taken the place of various nations of Europe." Unquote. This is actually a very profound point. The point basically is that when India does get independence, he's saying in 1880s, India does get independence, like Europe, it will have 20 odd nations. Each nation defined by a language. So Tamil Nadu would be a nation, Karnataka would be a nation, Maharashtra would be a nation, India would not be a nation. India is a civilization, which a cultural construct not a nation which is a political construct. 
And the famous definition of a nation is that a nation is like building a political roof over your cultural head. This definition is provided by Ernest Gellner, used by all of us and accepted by all of us. It is like building a political roof over your cultural head. A political roof over India's civilizational head could not be built, was the claim. Then here is another remarkable uh, uh, observation, and this is by a literary giant of the time, Mark Twain, who visited India in 1890s, was deeply, deeply influenced by India, was very impressed. This is what he had to say. India had the first civilization. She had the first accumulation of material wealth. She was populous with deep thinkers and subtle intellects. But if there had been but one India and one language, it would have prospered, in other words, it would have been nation. But there were 80 of them. Where there are 80 nations and several hundred governments, fighting and quarreling must be the common business of life. Unity of purpose and policy are impossible. Patriotism can have no healthy growth. This is a challenge that India's freedom movement accepted under the leadership of Gandhi. These are arguments. The, it, it, in today's social science language, this will be called an improbability. India was unlikely to be a nation, though these arguments were saying that India would not be a nation. India was unlikely to be a nation. The unlikelihood or improbability was turned into a reality by the freedom movement because of the ideas that animated that movement. And Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, played a stellar, stellar role. So, Gandhi's response was to delink language from nationhood. If India, if, if the freedom, um, uh, freedom fighters, the leaders of freedom movement, sought linguistic uniformity, a requirement in Mill's conception of nationhood, it would only lead to destruction and violence, argued Gandhi. In India, diversities were far too firmly historically rooted. Instead of one language, trying to create a one language, one nation, India would have to have a second layer of all India, an all India identity, leading to what we call today, that's not what Gandhi called it, leading to what we call today in the social sciences, a hyphenated identity. Indians would be Gujarati Indians, Maharashtrian Indians, Bengali Indians, Muslim Indians, Hindu Indians, Tamil Indians, not undifferentiated Indians. The survey work that Lok Niti has done comes up with this robust finding that even today, even today, this is a construction that Gandhi is proposing, even today, not more than 25 to 26 percent of Indians call themselves undifferentiated Indians. Even today. Gandhi understood this very well, that there would have to be a hyphenated identity. India would have to be Gujarati Indian, Bengali Indian, Muslim Indian, so on and so forth. Erasure of diversities would destroy India, not make it. Turns the argument of Mill, Mill, on, Mill on, its own, on its head. But it had to be created. Hmm? It is entirely conceivable that if, Indi if leaders of India's freedom movement had insisted on a European conception, there would indeed have been as many nations in India at the time of British departure as there, were in, as there, were, as there are in Europe, Europe today, 27, 28. Gandhi, when, when asked whether English would be an Indian language, this is 1919, his answer was, this also gives away the idea the, how he's delinking language from India. His answer was, I do not want my house to be walled in on all, walled in on all sides, and my windows to be stuffed. I want the cultures of all the lands to be blown about my house as freely as possible, but I refuse to be blown off my feet by any. I refuse to live in other people's houses as an interloper, beggar, or a slave. Today, today's language, in today's nationalism language, this is rooted cosmopolitanism. He, he, would, he refuses to be blown off, you know, by... Of, my, of his feet by any other currents, but he welcomes them. He welcomes them in his house. Gandhi also uh, argued that the English did not have to leave India when the British left, when, the, when independence came. It is not necessary, and this formulation comes in, 19, in Hind Swaraj. 
as early as the first decades of the 20th century, Gandhi is making this, Gandhi is proposing this. It is not necessary for us to have as our goal the expulsion of the English. If the English become Indianized, we can accommodate them. This is not a language-based conception of nationhood. This goes beyond the, the existing conceptions of nationhood. He also delinked religion and nationhood, which was not a problem in, in Europe at the time, was beginning to be a problem in India. By arguing, if the Hindus believe, quote, if the Hindus believe that India should be peopled only by Hindus, they are living in a dreamland. The Hindus, the Muslims, the Parsis, and the Christians who have made India their home are fellow countrymen. Unquote. Now, one should note that Gandhi was ambivalent towards what we call representative democracy. His ideal polity was village republics more in line with direct, not representative democracy. But the freedom movement that he, that he led, which built a nation, which created an all-India identity over a Gujarati one, a Maharashtrian one, a Tamil one, hmm? a Bengali one, this nation that was created then became the foundation of democracy. Right? So in a sense, Mill is right, no democracy without nationhood. In a sense, he's right, but, but the way he's proposing constructing nations, is, that's what Gandhi's challenging. And so this freedom movement that be becomes a mass movement by 1920 and goes on for another 27 years then creates a new identity. This is how uh, the freedom movement builds a political roof over India's cultural head. Okay. So um, I, one can talk about, I, I don't have enough time, and we'll have to talk about Nehru also, about how, the, how once Gandhi is gone, Nehru nurtures democracy. Uh, we're happy to talk about that. Nehru is not very much in fashion these days, primarily because of what his family has done to Indian politics, but Nehru should not be blamed for what his ch children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren have done to Indian politics. That's not how we should analyze Nehru. Uh, his his um, con contributions are also immense, but, uh, but this part, his contributions are immense and analyzed. This part is not analyzed when we analyze democracy. Therefore, I spend so much time talking about how the foundations of Indian democracy were created by talking about how the, the foundations of nationhood were put in place. Now to the liberal deficits. Um, there are some standard liberal freedoms in, that we talk about in political science. Freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom of association. And um, while in the beginning, in the 19th century, liberalism was not equated with the idea of equality. John Stuart Mill talked about how the poor of England should not get the right to vote. John Stuart Mill also talked about how the, how the, the um, lesser colonies, colonies of color, did not deserve democracy, like India. But white colonies, deserved democracy, uh, and which, which included Australia, uh, um, Canada, etc. So, uh, so uh, the liberalism of Mill, the father of 19th century liberal, liberal, liberalism of Mill did not believe in equality. But liberalism of late 20th century and 21st century is also equated with equality. Freedom, the liberal freedoms and the idea of equality, both they form the modern conception of liberalism. Now, um, the, I will, let, so let me talk about both of these. Um, and this is how I frame my position on this in the article that appeared in Journal of Asian Studies two days ago. India is at its freest at the time of elections. Short of inciting violence, virtually any argument can be made in election campaigns. But once an elected government takes over, it often places restrictions on liberty. Intellectuals, writers, artists, non-governmental organizations can face harassment on grounds that they hurt the sentiments of certain groups 
or undermine national interest. In a multi-religious society, which has had a deeply hierarchical system for centuries, some group or the other can always claim to be heard. Thus, Salman Rushdie could not participate in, in a literary festival because Mus the Muslim right, calling previous injury to religious sentiments, threatened disorder. M.F. Hussain had to leave the country because the Hindu right found his paintings religiously objectionable. Writers have been physically attacked, even killed. Their books have been burned or banned. Non-conforming intellectuals have been threatened. Social media has been periodically censored. And NGOs have been harassed. And if funded by foreign agencies, their financing cut off. These are clear violations of liberal freedoms. But please note that these problems are common to all kinds of governments. Rushdie, M.F. Hussain episodes were during Congress regime. But they become especially serious when Hindu nationalists come to power. Minorities then get added to the list of targets. A Hindu-centric view of the nation leads to that outcome. As we know, a mob led by Hindu nationalists lynched a Muslim man recently because they suspected he ate beef. Clear violation of freedom of religion, religious practice, and it could be under freedom of expression also. Churches can be vandalized, and they were, have not been recently, but they were when the last time Hindu nationalists were in power. And mosques also become a target of attack because Islam preaches proselytization had converted Hindus in the past. A revenge for that is a violation of liberal freedom. Whatever other arguments you want to give in, in favor, but a revenge for the proselytization of centuries ago is a violation of liberal freedoms. In all of these cases, the courts remain available to civilians, to citizens. But the judicial process can take an inordinately long time, trapping individuals in webs of harassment and grave financial distress. Courts do constrain arbitrary conduct of government. And press can also do that, but less effectively than the courts. Courts have constitutional power. Press it does not have constitutional power. But governments know that in the short run, power is on their side, and the courts would normally take long to subdue the executive or bureaucracy. The pressure mounted by opposition parties works best. In other words, India's democracy is more liberal when opposition parties are strong, meaning they have done well at the elections, though not won power. So in a very paradoxical way, it's the strength of opposition parties which makes India more liberal between elections. Otherwise, we have a problem between elections. Electoral vibrancy is not in doubt. India is also at its most equal at the time of elections. The state machinery can be unkind, even ruthless, towards the poor between elections. But all political parties systematically court the poor during the election campaigns. The poor, the lower caste, and the, mo the rural citizens now vote in very large numbers. The, the, it's been true since 1989. 2014 data shows that urban middle class actually and the more educated returned to the, to the polling booth. We still have to watch 2019 if it, it, the, the, the same, um, the 2014 pattern is repeated, then the trends that began in 1989 could be reversed. However, 1989 to 2014, the, the poor, the, 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 the lower caste and the less educated and the rural citizens 
voted, in a, voted as much as the urban and the more educated or higher. In effect, then, India has gone through a plebeian revolution, India's, India's democracy, and that is the claim that Jaffrello and Kumar have very rightly made in their book a couple of years ago. Caste inequalities have gone down, so long as we are on the, on the, uh, on the theme of equality, we should note, caste inequalities have gone down, many of us have worked on that, including me, more so in southern India than in northern India. New research shows that upper castes, if not financially well off, are willing to marry down. This is a new development. Endogamy was central to the caste system. Inter-caste marriages were very hard, were rare. But they're willing to marry down, especially if the lower castes are richer. The lower castes always wanted to marry up. There is clear evidence for that. But upper caste did not want to marry down. That is changing depending on the financial situation. Very good evidence for that. Ahuja and Osterman have, prepared, have published a paper in a journal that I edit very recently. But the idea that fellow citizens are equal remains only partially anchored in mass, mass consciousness. The notion that citizens have rights vis-a-vis -vis the state, which we call vertical citizenship. This is the Weberian, Marx Weber's notion of vertical citizenship, my rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. That is, has gone much farther than the idea that citizens are equal, that fellow citizens also have rights vis-a-vis -vis me. That's horizontal citizenship. The project that, that my team at Brown has done with Janagrahe, in, and the Bangalore part is over, shows that Bangalore citizens are much more willing to, may, uh, many more, substantially more, uh, uh, a great deal more, in proportions, right? The Bangalore citizens are, are willing to argue, and we think this is true all over India, that they have rights vis-a-vis -vis the state. But not that fellow citizens are equal and should be treated equally. So vertical citizenship has gone very far, and, and the voting is also a vertical citizenship idea. I will change, my vote will change the government. It's a, it's a vertical citizenship idea. Uh, and, and as far as elections are concerned, there's absolutely no doubt left that they are free and fair. And the incumbents have often lost. That's one, one clear evidence of that. So to conclude, what is the overall summary that we can present on the record of Indian democracy? One of my, my first mentor was Myron Wiener. My second mentor was Samuel Huntington, both deceased. Samuel Huntington wrote this about American democracy. Famous last lines of his book, um, Promise of Disharmony. Critics say that America is a lie because its reality falls so far short of its ideals. They are wrong. America is not a lie, it is a disappointment. But it can be a disappointment only because it's also hope. Is this simply a play on or play with words? There is a profound idea here. America was founded on the idea of equality and freedom. A nation founded on the idea of equality and freedom denied equality and freedom to African Americans and indigenous Americans for a very long time. And when, even after slavery ended, slavery of, of African Americans ended, Jim Crow laws emerged, which which made it clear that African Americans were second or third rate citizens, ex second or third class citizens of America. It's only with 1965 Voting Rights Act that their voting becomes legally secure. Right? So the critics say that American democracy, look at its ideals, the founding ideals, and look at the reality. The book was about how that gap was indeed large and therefore quite a disappointment but that the gap is closing, though hasn't fully closed. Gap is closing, and it's disappointing it has taken so long, but the hope is that the gap would close even more. The same lines can be written about India's democracy. Surveying a history of two centuries, Huntington was disappointed, though he remained rooted in the hope of further reform. India has spent only 68 years under democracy. 
a deeply hierarchical society and severe restrictions of freedom have come, a society marked by those characteristics have come, has come quite far, but it needs to go much farther. A battle for deeper democracy, not democracy per se, has to begin. And that deeper democracy would involve greater respect for liberal freedoms, not simply electoral excellence and vibrancy. It's not Russia that broke up. Soviet Union broke up. The idea of creation of a new Soviet man who would not have nationalism in him or her, but a communist consciousness, was indeed the project of the revolutionaries. That there would be a new man in, in the space called Soviet Union. This new man would not be dragged down or brought down by nationalist sentiments, just as the idea of equality and freedom created the United States, the idea of communism would create the Soviet Union and that idea would make it last. So in retrospect, certainly we can say there were no, we couldn't do surveys, political scientists couldn't do surveys in the Soviet Union, but in ret retrospect we certainly can say that the idea of communism failed. It could not undermine or neutralize nationalist sentiments. So the Central Asian republics or, or, or Estonia and Latvia did not feel very Soviet. Some of them felt Soviet. Most of them felt Estonian and Latvian and Uzbek, etc. Right? So the idea, this idea that, that Gandhi created for India or idea that American Revolution created for America is not the idea that succeeded in Soviet Union. Let me just add a little question on top of that because one is the idea that you say of communism which hasn't worked out or has failed as a, as a nation uniting project. But you also now have in large parts of the world around the Middle East which are completely roiled by conflict and where, again, the idea of the nation state has collapsed. And you're seeing, at least this is a conventional narrative, that you're seeing old animosities come to the surface, uh, and there's a lack of clarity on when things will actually settle down. How would you, in the context of what you just said, how would you analyze what's happening there? So the best uh, analysis that's available, academic analysis that's available, uh, would agree with what you said, that um, the secular national project that was led by people like Nasser, let's say, um, um, or the Ba'ath Party in Syria and, 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 and Iraq, this secular national project failed. So the, the nation state that they were trying to create indeed is in distress. And the idea that has emerged for uniting uh, uh, the people so left by the failure of, uh, of the nation pro national project is emerging through Islam and in two forms, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam. And it's not clear whether Islam will be either in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in its Sun Sunni variant or its Shia variant would be able to unite and be a substitute for a nation. It's not clear. But the battle is underway, and it's a bloody battle. It is. Sorry, anyone else? Yeah. Uh, do we have a mic, too? Uh, you um, talked about how the Indian survival of Indian democracy was kind of unexpected, you know, based on certain social theory and all that. And you also raised the concept of this hyphenated identity, you know. Um, do you think that this model is ahead of its time and do you think a lot of western nations which are now facing a lot of pressures from the ethnic groups and you know ethnic conflicts within or you know the immigrant conflicts do you think they will also soon have to start looking at this you know rather than the melting pot as a way of creating democracy rather than that this hyphenated identity do you think it's going to become more prevalent even in the western democracies well i, I don't think western democracies are feeling a national threat Whatever, they, whatever threat they, they, they're experiencing, it's not an existential threat to European nations. It's a question about how to integrate 
minorities. It's a question about how to integrate maybe refugees now, right? But I don't think there is an existential threat to the nation. However, you raise the point about melting pot. Right? It is now widely believed that the melting pot idea of the nation was essentially a 19th century or early 20th century idea, that it cannot work. That, that nations will have to think about how to deal with diversity rather than melting all the minorities into the majority pot. That, was some, that could be done in the 19th century and early 20th century, but it is not a model for, late, uh, for early 21st century. It was not a model for even late 20th century. That's actually a disastrous and violent project today. Professor Vashni, in terms of solutions, what, um, what do you think is the way forward for deepening democracy, as you mentioned? Is it, does it lie in strengthening our institutions, or is the hope in, uh, in the political leadership and political parties? Excellent, but very difficult question. Um, uh, it, lecture, yeah, very difficult question. Uh, some of us have started thinking about it. It's not that we haven't. Uh, the question of how to make India a more vibrant democracy between elections, right? So this is a project that, for example, is emerging at Azim Prem University. I'm involved with that. We are beginning to collect data on this, think about it. Some early ideas can be presented, but not very good, very good empirically, um, empirically a solid answers. Mm. And uh, th there's no doubt that one has to find a way to make courts speedier, that's one level. There's no doubt that, that the third wing of the government, whether it's urban municipal or panchayats, we have to find ways to make them more effective and more citizen involving. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I don't see how that can be done because after all, local governments are under state governments. Even the, even the constitutional amendment, 73rd, they say the state governments, local governments as under state governments. So even if you transfer resources to them from Delhi, that has to go through state government. So it's, it, is, it is some kind of constitutional amendment, perhaps, which will make the third wing of government more, 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 more powerful. Right? Whether that const when and whether that constitutional amendment will come through, you know, we have to think about we don't know. But these are early ideas. How to make citizenry more powerful at, between elections, not simply at the time of election, is the, is the question you're asking. And it's a very difficult question to answer. But how to make citizens powerful between elections is, of course, the way to think about it. Let me, let me just add again uh, something to that. Because one of the things that uh, particularly my father was uh, engaged with uh, towards the later stage was with the whole idea of political party reform which is something that the moment you say, everyone just glazes over. Uh, no one takes it very seriously. But he felt quite strongly, and this was again part of his schizoid approach towards politics and political parties, where on one hand he viewed them with all the skepticism and cynicism that came from being, in a sense, in the Gandhian mold. But at the same time, he was deeply engaged with the political process. And he felt that ultimately, and he, I think in fact he even wrote a paper about it, that political parties are the cornerstone of democracy. And at some level you have to start repairing the broken political party system in India, which in his book he describes as, uh, from the time of Indira Gandhi, the Bata Shu model of political uh, parties, where you have a dealer who appoints the sub-dealers and who appoints the sub-dealers below them. And that's the model that we have. So whether you talk about uh, greater inner party democracy, the way that party elections are conducted, that it's more grassroots based, more representative, whether you talk about political finance, all of these things could also be part of the project of deepening democracy. Yeah, I think uh, that that's correct. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, your, your father wrote about it and uh, Ram Guha has a very interesting phrase for, phrase, for it, phrase for it in his, the last chapter of his book. Yeah. He calls India 50-50 democracy, yeah. using Johnny Walker's phrase, you know, 50-50, yes. <laughs> yeah? yeah? India's 50-50, Johnny Walker used to say. That's right. So Ram, Ram cites Johnny Walker to make the claim that it's 50-50, and the 50 that is not democratic in that, in that formulation is the political party. Yes. 
and the party system and and, the, and, and campaign finance. Yes. Now, there's no doubt that that will also be, have to be part of a deep, uh, pa conceptually has to be part of uh, deepening of democracy. Uh, business finances India's campaigns, yes. uh, but it's not open financing. Yes. It's very opaque. It's very opaque. Uh, business, of course, is unable to determine election results, but it finances elections. Um, now, um, uh, so uh, campaign finance, if, but nonetheless, if business is going to finance campaigns, it would get something in return. Whether or not it determines, it can determine election wording. It can't. Yes. It would get something in return. And that clientelistic relationship is a, is a form of, of uh, uh, corruption. Yeah. Similarly, now political, no constitution as far as I know anywhere, and I'm subject to correction if somebody has studied this. No constitution, democratic constitution anywhere in the world says that political parties have to have internal elections. Constitutionally, it's not required. But n the norm in all advanced democracies is that, that parties would have elections. That you have either primaries, as in, as in America. Yes. Primaries will determine who will, who will get the re Republican nomination, Democratic nomination. Right? That's inner party democracy. Yes. Right? And, and um, there was inner party democracy in, the, in, in India until 1973, at least in the Congress party. 1920, Mahatma Gandhi institutes the elective principle inside the Congress party. And the cadres develop district uh, level, provincial uh, always elected, district level elected, and of course the central level All India uh, uh, Congress committee is elected. Yes. Right? That lasted till 73, and then Mrs. Gandhi uh, got rid of that system. And it's not returned. It, it returned for a year in 1994 uh, when elections were introduced. And the Arjun Singh versus Narasimha Rao problem led to the suspension of that as, as well. So you're right. So that's, Even that's that will have to be part of this deepening pro democracy project. No doubt about that. One is citizens being made more powerful. Secondly, campaign finance and political parties cleaned up. It, well, citizens, it's very hard to do that. Yeah, and, and citizens putting pressure on, on political parties to do that. Yes. When you talked of constitution, I was reminded of the fact that my father, I think uh, ADR, which all of us know, Association of Democratic Reforms, which is sort of anchored in Bangalore, or at least used to be. It has, is, still has, is, It I mean, still is, yeah. and has re, you know, fought remarkably for uh, uh, inner party, democ uh, for political reform. And he, he tried to do a survey, my father, with uh, Jay Prakash Narayan of Lok Sattah, where they collected the constitutions of all political parties and actually studied them and then did a survey to ask members of their own parties whether anyone had actually read their own constitution. And virtually nobody had. I, I think most of them didn't even know that the constitution existed. So, again, I think, you know, to me, when we talk about, again, the idea of deepening democracy, I'm amazed that this is not a revolution in this country, that people are not more agitated about how political parties conduct their own election, who gets thrown up, how do MLAs get selected, where does the money come from? True. So, sorry, that was my little rant. No, so, in other words, this is sort of, we're talking, this is like, this is like two cheers for democracy or one cheers for Indian democracy. It's not three cheers. Right? It's not three cheers. So you could say one cheers or what, one cheer or two cheers depending on your perspective. But we are far away from three cheers. And these are the issues that need to be straightened out. These, these, you know, uh, and I think it's a, it's a huge project and, and probably will. Closer to three in some cases. You know, for example, what, what's happening to American democracy today, Donald Trump. The Donald Trump phenomenon is a very interesting phenomenon. Donald Trump is clearly representing, according to our estimates, 20% of America. These are the views of one f every fifth person in America. Right? Now, of course, 80% would finally check that. Is the hopefully. hopefully, and if he goes further, then of, then then there won't be three chairs. But, but three chairs would be eighty percent checking the, the, this twenty percent tendency that Donald Trump is representing. Every time he makes a statement of that kind, he's not hurt. He's not hurt by a statement that Mexicans are criminals. He's not hurt by a statement that Muslims should be banned. He's not hurt. He is actually popularity jumps by two three percentage points. And it also says something about their free speech laws that you can actually say stuff like that and not face any so legal threat. Freedom so. of expression protects that. Uh, you have to, can someone prove this is hate speech? Hate speech is not protected. 
can you prove this is hate speech? So that's a legal matter. Otherwise, freedom of expression protects uh, Donald Trump, and he can say these things uh, without, uh, without, he can only think of political consequences. Legally, he thinks he's, he is safe. Legally, thinks he is safe. However, the 20% would be checked is the hope. Then it would be time to say three cheers again. And a, and a woman likely to be elected, that, that's close to three cheers. A black man was elected. Right? That's close to three cheers. So, I, I mean, I I'm not saying it's a perfect democracy. That no one is claiming that. But that, that, the idea of primaries, the idea of a woman likely to be elected, the idea of a black man elected twice, these are remarkable developments. I think this gentleman, and then we should, should we wrap up. Last question, sir. Uh, you replied to two of the questions. In one question regarding Europe, you said they do not have this problem of disparate identities. Uh, if you look at the population demographic surveys now, the female reproductive rates of indigenous populations in Europe are all falling. It's between 1.4 and 2, uh, 1.8, whereas you need 2.1 to keep society going. And all their populations are increasing, which points to the fact that the migrant populations are increasing at a very high rate, offsetting the fall in the female reproductive rate of the indigenous population and coming out on top. So there is, I would beg to differ with you, there is an existential uh, dilemma in the long run there. Firstly, that question. Secondly, the same arguments that were advanced that Soviet Union did not have the grand narrative, the grand narrative of an identity didn't stick and therefore it broke up. The same argument could be applied to India. We have no grand narrative and yet we are sticking together, which brings me to my actual question. Uh, it's very interesting to note that you have explained our uh, democratic sustainability here, sustenance. But you, it's interesting that you have not even uh, obliquely referred to our deep civilizational ethos of mutual respect in our tradition, which I think is one of the foundational basis for all the others to follow. Is there a question, sir? Or that, or this is an observation. No, I would like an answer on why our deep civilizational ethos has not been included in one of the reasons you said structural, and I'm noting. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, the first question is about whether Muslims in France, who are 10% right now, will become 50% and cause an existential threat threat to France. I mean, the analysis of the demographers would say that they are 10% now, when the Muslims of France are richer, their reproduction rate also will decline. At higher incomes, you tend to produce less kids, fewer kids, right? So it's not, it's not even if they might have higher rep reproduction rate right now, but to believe that the same reproduction rate will continue endlessly and Muslims of France will become 50% of France is, I think, a stretch, right? Um, um, the reproduction rate of, of uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you talk about reproduction, demographers of India have studied, studied that, the reproduction rate of Muslims is not higher than the reproduction rate of the poor people of India. It has something to do with poverty, not simply culture or religion. Maybe a mix of the two. Right? So, so I don't think this thesis that, uh, that Muslims would become an existential threat, threat to France or to Britain holds any validity if demographic analysis is, is of any value. Hmm? They, what demographers have said about, about re, uh, re, reproduction rate and how they've connected that to income levels. So I just want to add yeah. very quickly to that, hmm? that even on the subject of refugees, for all the fear mongering about numbers, numbers, if you actually look at the numbers per se across the European Union, it's infinitesimal. It's 100,000 that have come in this last wave and this is the highest ever number that have come to Europe's doors. If you break that up over the 26 countries, 10,000 go there, 20,000 go there, this kind of alarmism that is creating huge demographic shifts is absolute rubbish, statistically. And I'm happy Le Pen was, uh, has, uh, has been defeated yesterday. It seemed like she was winning, but she's been yeah. defeated yesterday. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. And I think, I think, uh, I think uh, Trump will be also defeated. By, I mean, of course, we can all be wrong, but I don't see any likelihood of you know, Trump winning. Um, uh, on, the, on this grand civilizational ethos of India. Yeah. 
Yes. Well, he is responding to that. Yeah. The grand narrative of India was created by India's freedom movement. It had certain principles. Ishwar Allah Tere Naam Sabko Sanmati Deh Bhagwan. It had songs. Songs were sung. People, my mother, my deceased mother went to jail as a 16-year-old girl in Meerut singing those Gandhian songs. She had never met Gandhi. She had never seen Gandhi. She, but Gandhian values had gone down that much, had been internalized by millions of people. Now, Gandhian values were not simply, my father, my deceased father wore khadi until his death. He started wearing khadi in 1928. Right? These, this grand narrative, was, grand narrative was challenged, of course, by Hindu nationalism. Was challenged. But Hindu nationalism did not win, the, they did not lead the freedom movement. Hindu nationalists did not go to jail. And my mother was not a Hindu nationalist. They did not go to jail, they avoided jails. Who went to jail? Thousands and thousands of people went to jail, internalizing those ideas. Now that narrative is being challenged, I agree, but that was the narrative with which India was born as a nation. And those principles are constitutionally enshrined. India is not a Hindu nation according to India's constitution. And the day Mr. Modi says that, I think he'll be in trouble. He cannot say that after having taken a constitutional oath. India is not a Hindu nation according to India's constitution. And he's taken a constitutional oath. Okay, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, I am supposed to do the vote of thanks, so let me stand up and do it because that's a little more formal. I feel a little <laughs> informal sitting here. Uh, I just want to say actually that uh, I have really no business giving the vote of thanks because the wonderful thing about this entire lecture series uh, in my father's honor is organized from start to finish uh, by Janagraha. So really, uh, on behalf of all of us, uh, the Jain family, many of whom are here, and several of those who are not able to be here, uh, first and foremost, I just want to thank Ramesh, Swati, Partha, the entire Janagraha family uh, for being able to do this. Uh, this is the second year in a row. So can we have a round of applause uh, for them, first and foremost? I think uh, as, as a you know, as, as a child or as a family member, it's, it's wonderful to have a parent uh, over whom many people claim ownership, uh, many groups and many institutions. So Janagraha is doing this. Uh, there are some friends in Delhi and everywhere who are doing a, a wonderful initiative to support uh, Kashmiri craftspeople, young Kashmiri crafts entrepreneurs, because that was one of my uh, father's passions. So, uh, uh, you know, for us, because we're still, to be honest, uh, dealing with the, the grief of his loss. Uh, this is a wonderful way to uh, remember him, uh, you know, with, with all of you. So once again, uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, of course, it was a, a, a great news to hear that uh, this year the lecture would be given by uh, Professor Ashutosh Varshne, someone uh, whose work I have greatly admired, uh, starting uh, with his book, uh, which looked at uh, the linkages between sectarian conflict and the economic uh, links between communities, between Hindus and Muslims, which I thought was a, a remarkable take uh, to look at the anatomy of, of how sectarian conflict takes place. Actually, if I may, yes. just interrupt for a moment. Sure. You uh, and Rajdeep yes. created a 10-minute segment of, for, on your new show okay. when the book was released in 2002. Right. 10-minute segment I got on your prime time, which was very nice. <laughs> well, it was, two, discussing, it discussing was 2002, so I'm, I, you were extremely topical. Uh, <laughs> and of course, since then, uh, we've all followed you and your writings uh, in, you know, in the Indian Express and otherwise, and uh, you are always engaging as you were today. So uh, it was actually, it was, you know, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. It was wonderful to have you here. And of course, thank you. Uh, to the audience for, for coming along. It was really nice to, to have this in Bangalore. This is a sort of a home team advantage that we have here. It's uh, both the home of the Janagraha family and of our own uh, family. So uh, we look forward, of course, to the lecture going to other places and uh, you know we'll hopefully have a, an audience as wonderful as this. Uh, so thank you all very much indeed for coming. Thank you. <clears throat>